Good morning, and thank you for coming. My name is Pete Haggard. Uh, you know a little bit about me already. Um, my wife and I uh, wrote this field guide to insects of this area about, oh, six years ago. And uh, we did it because there was nothing, uh, there was a California guide of insects, but we have more to do, I think, with Oregon and Washington and British Columbia as far as our climate is. And so we decided to do this and uh, uh, we promote it. If, if you're looking for a good insect book for this area, uh, this would be a good one to have. All right, um, my interest in biodiversity is in gardening or urban uh, landscaping. And uh, when I started school here and drove up from the LA area, um, there was a lot more open spaces than there are now. And I can see a huge change coming and continuing where huge pieces of land are taken out of uh, natural areas and put into gardens. And I think this generation here has lost their contact uh, with the gardening, uh, the value of a garden. If you drive around Eureka or the Bay Area or Los Angeles, you'll see a lot of yards that really uh, brown grass, possibly some junipers or something like that put in there. And for me, that's a huge loss of what could be um, native areas for what insects and wildlife used to be there. So for the past, 20 plus years at least, uh, I've been working on how to develop a landscape uh, and to make that landscape as friendly as you can for wildlife. And hopefully at some point we'll write a book on that and people can use that as a guide no matter where they live and uh, start incorporating native plants into the landscape and start thinking about what you can do to encourage uh, wildlife in your garden. The first picture on here that you see, um, could someone give me the, uh, the, the, yeah, that. So I think most people that see the first slide up here, can all of you read what it says? Uh, a warning, unimproved natural conditions exist in this park. And that brought a smile to my face when I saw it, but I think that's the problem. More of us are getting used to living in cities and all the, um, all the dangers there become commonplace. So when you come up here or go to Lassen or whatever, they put signs like that up here. And when I give some of my talks, people will come up to me and say, you know, Pete, I'd like to make my garden more friendly to wildlife, uh, things like native bees and stuff like that, but I have small children and they could be stung and die. Um, so now a lot of people see natural areas as being more dangerous than cities. And uh, we, we have to change that back to the way it used to be, I think. We also have to encourage people, I think, to grow things. It's not strictly native plants. I think it's anything to do with gardening that we can get people to see the land they have around them as being valuable, to having value. And as long as people don't see that, um, you'll, you'll see brown grasses, you'll see uh, ill-kept yards uh, that have no value really for uh, wildlife. This is my place in Fieldbrook, and if you're not familiar with uh, up here, it's near McKinleyville. And this was my first uh, area that I planted to native plants. And I used my garden uh, on walks and talks about how to grow native plants and encourage wildlife. And I wanted, in this case, a small area dedicated strictly to all native plants. And um, when we say native plants, it's native plants to this area. 
It is not California natives. It's natives to Humboldt County and mostly coastal. And why is that? Because that's what native wildlife need is native plants to this area, not to uh, uh, the sequoias or opuntia or uh, different plants like that. It's really important that we grow plants that are native here. And over a period of time, the garden has changed and enlarged and also through the seasons. One of the things I tried to do is for gardeners, uh, having color in your garden over a long period of time is really important. So what I've, uh, I have tried to do is uh, grow a, a range of native plants that provide color from uh, late spring into late fall when the first frost come here. And so when you walk through my garden, uh, you, depending on the month you walk through it, you will see lots of color, hopefully. I think that, okay, you can't. And the importance of that is two reasons. One, for people to encourage them, oh, I can grow native plants and have a, a beautiful, colorful garden over a long period of time. I don't necessarily have to run down to Kmart in the spring and get 26 packs and then in the, the fall get some more. I can actually grow what occurs here naturally. And picture yourself as a butterfly or a native bee flying over my garden. The next two gardens are dried grass. Uh, would you stop at my place or would you stop in the middle of a barren lawn? And uh, so the color not only adds to the value for people, it also uh, encourages uh, wildlife to, to um, come into the garden. All right, I often hesitate to use the monarch because it's sort of like the baby seal that's getting beaten with a club. It's used too much uh, to encourage people to uh, think about things like that. But I found that a lot of people identify with the, uh, the monarch, realize that it's a very unusual insect. It is a, has a migration. So I'm going to use it. It occurs in, in my garden. It is a native uh, insect. Uh, everybody wants it in their garden. And one of the things I learned uh, that uh, after planting the food plant of the uh, female is when the plant in the early spring gets uh, two to three inches tall, a monarch female flying over or near my house can pick it out. And I absolutely don't know how she does it, but those eggs were laid when that plant there was only uh, like two inches tall. And how she picks that out, because there are none of this plant within probably 50 miles of my house, or at least 20 miles. So it is one of those things as you, you enrich your garden, you learn a lot of stuff. Okay, and there's the larva on the plant. Uh, remember, it's not important to um, get the butterflies in through plants like that flower like Bodelia and, and things like that. It's more important to provide uh, the larval food plant because that means it can live in your yard. And in this case, it's milkweed. This is the pupa of it, very beautiful jewel. Uh, it's, it's really nice when you have friends over, kids to show them uh, these pupa. And this is what really brings monarchs into a garden. This is a native milkweed. It's called uh, beautiful milkweed, and it's probably one of the prettiest flowering plants I have in my garden. Uh, the flowers are beautiful. They provide lots of nectar and pollen, so it encourages a lot of uh, native wildlife like uh, native bees and, and other um, butterflies, flies, things like that to come into the garden. Uh, but remember, this has to be there for that female to stop in your garden and lay her eggs, and that's what I'm trying to get. Uh, at is to think of what will make your garden a home for wildlife, not just attract things. You don't want just a bird feeder. 
you want a home for birds too. I'm going to use a couple of local insects uh, that live in this area. And this is a Lorcan's admiral. And what you see there is a, um, a banjo shaped piece of willow leaf with a uh, larva on it. What the female does, she lays her, an egg in the late fall. That larva comes out, finds a willow leaf, uh, goes to the base of the willow leaf and silks it to the stem of the willow. And so that leaf can't fall out, fall off in the, in the fall. It, it t may turn color, but it can't fall off because the larva has silked that. Then the larva cuts out that banjo-like template on there. And I'm going to back off. This is silk. And what it does, it silks the end of that into a tube. And that stays in that tube all winter long. And any idea what the, this area would be for? That's where it goes out and suns itself on sunny days in the winter. So it's a porch for it to, to actually go out there and sun itself. Remember, this is a willow tree, so in the winter there are no leaves on it to feed on. It's just existing there uh, all, all winter. And then when spring comes and the leaves come out, it, goes, it leaves that little home it has, or hibernaculum, and starts feeding on leaves. And you can see this one completely changes. And you see that white splash on a dark background on the larva? That indicates it's a bird poop mimic. And if you think about what we have the least interest in, it's our own poop. Uh, in fact, it causes diseases and things like that. So mimicking a bird poop uh, means it is protected from birds. And you can see those two bumps near the head of it there. Those look like berry seeds, blackberry seeds. So it's a really good mimic of, of bird poop. And it gets quite big also. So willow trees are very important to a lot of species. And there it, came, it, it comes out the next summer and the whole process goes on. And the Lorcan's Admiral is very adapted to our cool coastal climate. So it's one we see all summer. One more. Oh, willows. Maybe not. Uh, when people say, what, what are some important plants to grow in a garden? Uh, willows and alders always, for me, take the top list because um, they provide so much food for other animals. And this is our local willow, um, Salix lucida, or shining willow. And it's in flower there. And this is the one you might see in the spring uh, along the highway where there are a lot of yellow flowers on it. So this is probably one of our prettiest willows when it's flowering. Uh, it really is a standout for that reason. And when it's blooming, and this is willows blooming very early in late winter, early spring, and that means that there's a lot of uh, native bees, hummingbirds, things like that, that are desperate for nectar and pollen. So I try to make sure I have willows there uh, for them to get a good start early in the season. And this is how willows look this time of the year. And if you drive around this area, 299, you will see a lot of the willows that have this look to them. This isn't fall colors. Every bit of the green on the leaf has been eaten off by an insect. Many different insects do this. And the only thing that's left on there are the veins. And so willows, spring, summer, winter are homes, food, uh, nesting, hiding places. So willows are a very good, willows and alders are excellent wildlife 
uh, plant for a garden. And uh, fortunately in California, we have a lot of different willows from very small to large ones. So you get a pick. All right, we're gonna go to one more uh, willow feeder. And this is, you can't tell, but this is a large egg on the bottom of a leaf which is the bird poop and which is the larva. The one on the uh, left is, is a larva of a swallowtail, but you can see how it matches uh, bird poop pretty, pretty well, and that protects the small larva. As a swallowtail larva grows and gets much larger, it, it changes completely into this critter here, and it's probably two and a half inches long. Over winters as this brown pupa on the side of a tree and in the fall and winter that brown matches really good bark and, and dead twigs. So it's, it really does blend in well. And that's what it turns into. Uh, one of the largest butterflies we have in this area. And again, it's one of those that takes our coastal climate very well, Western Swallowtail. All right, I said it's really important to get things off well in the spring and, and I'm gonna kind of narrow my focus down to plants that provide nectar and pollen early. And the willow is one for sure. And this, manzanita, is probably the most important plant up here for providing nectar uh, for things like hummingbirds, uh, bumblebees and other native bees. Uh, in the cold winter, sometimes manzanitas start blooming in uh, December or January. And one thing you notice, um, in our garden, we don't put out feeders for hummingbirds or birds at all. So the first thing on a cold day, you'll see hummingbirds uh, waiting for the sun to come up. And as soon as it gets warm, they're down on the the manzanita flowers getting that first nectar of the day, which, which probably means there's more of it in there. And the same thing at the other end of the day, uh, just before the sun goes down, you'll see the uh, hummingbirds working those flowers. And during the day, the bumblebees and, and native uh, bees are, are working them. So willows and manzanitas in this area are very critical to get, getting many things off to a good start. And if you live inland and in most of California, oaks are a great plant to have in your garden. I'm not going to speak much about oaks because they don't do well on the coast here. But this is a gall on, galls on the leaf of a, uh, of a white oak, and these are uh, starburst galls. And oaks are very well noted for all the different kinds of galls on them. Excellent wildlife food. All right, what are some other ones, uh, flowering plants that make good uh, also ornamentals and also wildlife food? Uh, this is twinberry, uh, beautiful flowers. Uh, it naturally grows in areas uh, near water. So unlike a lot of California natives, if you keep this watered, it will flower and fruit all summer long. And we like to, to plant the, uh, this particular plant near our windows so when we eat breakfast or whatever, we can see the birds using this plant all summer long. And the tubular flowers are great for hummingbirds, uh, particularly when they're nesting. They'll aggressively protect these areas so they can get all the nectar. And bumblebees are quite fond of the flowers. All right, and it's called twinberry because those twin flowers turn into a fairly large blueberry-sized fruit. And uh, fruit-eating birds, particularly when they're nesting, uh, uh, keep them picked, well-picked during the year. So this is, has a lot of qualities both for people and for wildlife. So this is a really excellent plant to, to put in your garden. And uh, I wish this was my garden. This is a picture of hair grass uh, along Humboldt Bay. And in the early summer, quite often when it's flowering like this, uh, it gets golden, uh, very gorgeous. Uh, I'm trying to use it more in, in landscapes that I'm involved with. 
And uh, grasses have a lot of beauty. And there's also lots of insects and things that use them. And this is a woolly worm that turns into this. And if you've lived here very long, these are very common in the summer. Uh, these are a moth that mimics a wasp. They fly during the day. And anytime you see black and red on an insect, it means danger. Uh, birds don't mess with me. And if a bird bites into that, those red shoulders ooze a chemical that's a repellent to birds. So they're pretty safe flying during the day from everything but uh, cars and people. All right, another in the middle of summer, uh, lupin is a great plant. This is um, Rivularis, it's the species. I, I think people in here might argue that it isn't that species, but I think it is. Um, and lupins produce a great deal of color over a fairly long time. And there's lots of things that eat the leaves, uh, use the flowers for uh, uh, pollen and nectar. And uh, one of the most flourishes uh, plants you can put in your garden. And this is a butterfly that lays its eggs on lupin and other plants like that. There's a number of butterflies that use lupin for their lar larval food plants. This is a mallow. Uh, if you're a gardener, you know that mallows are pretty popular in the nursery trade. And this is malva flora. This is Sedelcia malva flora. Uh, it grows probably on every logging road in Humboldt County. It's very common. It's a beautiful plant, small plant with large flowers. There's at least four butterflies that lay their eggs on it. Uh, there's lots of things that use its flowers for nectar and pollen. And it's another one of those uh, California natives that grows in moist areas. So this, if you keep it watered, will uh, bloom from late spring until frost with flowers like that. So it's one of those plants that I recommend anybody that likes to garden and likes to bring in uh, different kinds of wildlife. This is the leaf of uh, the uh, plant. This is an old stem. That's an old stem to the, the right. And that's a fresh leaf to the left. And what you see on there kind of looks like sawdust. And that tells you immediately that this plant has another use. Um, native bees use the stem. And when they use the stem, they chew up the center of it. And you see that sawdust around the base or on leaves near it. So you immediately know that there's uh, one kind of bee using it. And this is called a small carpenter bee. It actually looks more like a wasp, but it is a uh, carpenter bee. There's uh, the stem broken where there's a female backing her way out and there's a male waiting for her. Usually when the females are coming out, waves of males are searching for her. And while I was taking this picture, males kept constantly landing on that, uh, knowing that that a fresh male was, or fresh female was coming out of that stem. All right, and not only is, is it spring important to get wildlife of different uh, kinds uh, going well with plants, native plants, but fall is also a very tough time. Most of the plants that have flowered are done now. Uh, so you have to pick a, a, a particular group in asters. Uh, are late blooming plants, and so are goldenrods. And uh, the nice thing about them is both of them grow well here, the native one, this is Chiliensis uh, blue flowered one. They produce tons of flowers when nothing else is blooming. And right now, um, you'll see butterflies of all kinds just surrounding patches of aster. Uh, this particular aster uh, grows almost everywhere around here if there's a little bit of water. So you want to make sure that spring and fall are covered as far as pollinators and different wildlife. So 
uh, try to plan to have uh, late blooming things going in your garden too. One of the butterflies that uses this particular um, plant, this aster, is, is a field crescent spot. And they like this area a lot. Some of them, I think, have at least three generations here locally. Uh, remember, the, the butterfly doesn't need the flower. The butterfly needs the foliage of the plant uh, because that's what the larvae feed on. So. A lot of people want to encourage native bees, and this is one of them on um, uh, a native buckwheat. But it's more important, uh, the buckwheat brings them in, but they also need uh, a place to build their home. And I, I don't know how well you can see that, but that's a burrow, and that's a female with her eyes looking out at me, uh, but often they guard these holes. And what many of the bees, native bees, need is bare ground, and which sounds hard to provide, but that's what a vegetable garden is. It is full of bare ground. And so our gardens tend to be really good sites for uh, particularly uh, native bees. Bumblebee, um, having that reddish brown butt on the end of it makes it mixtus, uh, the name of it. It's very common here. Most bumblebees nest in the ground um, and require uh, gopher or mole holes to build their nests. They can't build them themselves. They use what's there. So they're, again, uh, they need a place where people <laughs> don't eliminate all the gophers and moles. They, the, and particularly if you understand moles and, and gophers, moles do not eat plants. They uh, uh, eat uh, insects and things like that. So having moles in your garden is actually a very positive thing and provides nesting places for the uh, uh, bumblebees. Leaf cutter bees, very common. Uh, this is a leaf cutter bee cutting a willow tree leaf. This is an old fart in Fieldbrook digging them up to find out where they nest. This is the nest I found. And there's the, uh, the larva of the bee inside a cell. Uh, what you saw I think was three cells and in each cell the female uh, puts pollen and nectar in there, lays her egg, and then seals it up again. Um, and then they come out in the fall, or the next spring, I should say. Um, if they nest in a vegetable garden or a flower garden, why do you think I'm digging up that area uh, to look and see, uh, uh, see that they're there? And, and what I'm really doing is seeing how deep they are because most gardeners, vegetable gardeners, rototill their garden. And if you do that, certainly very deep, I found out you eliminate most of the bees by doing that. So over the last six or seven years, I only rototill uh, uh, two to three inches of the, the, the surface. Uh, it's it increased the number of bees in my garden by tons. I mean, literally hundreds of bees nest there now. But you have to do things like that and learn what makes uh, or gives them the ability to continue their life cycle in your areas. Other areas they like is uh, paths that are uh, part ground and that get really uh, concrete like by walking on them all year. Uh, those are really good areas for bees to nest in. But I think gardens, as long as you understand some of the complexities of, of their life cycle and change things that can be changed as far as a gardener, you really make it easier uh, for wildlife. All right, and that's the adult that comes out, uh, uh, the uh, leaf cutter bee, that's an adult female. 
All right, some things that probably people don't think about as far as wildlife is this area used to be full of large trees, large old trees, and large old dying trees. And that's even down south, uh, if that was true with the old oaks, that they, over a period of 100 years, they start to go downhill. Well, there's a whole group of, of wildlife, insects, birds, mammals, that need uh, sick and dying trees to live, to make holes in, to make their nests in, to feed on. And we as humans have pretty much eliminated that. No one uh, arborist would tell you to leave a sick tree in your yard or in a park. Traditionally, you take out sick trees, things like that. Well, that's just the opposite of what, what I try to do. I realize that there's a whole group of critters out there that need older trees to live. And this is a uh, pileated woodpecker. Uh, it's one of our largest woodpeckers and is dependent on large old trees. And this is an alder in our garden. These uh, same tree, these, uh, it, these holes in the, the bark are, call, are done by sap suckers. And they punch holes in the bark and come back in an hour or so when the sap comes out. And that's a really important part of their life cycle. Uh, when I worked for the agriculture department, we would call this damage. But now that I'm getting, trying to convince people to allow this to happen, this is just bird feeding activities. This is just an activity. This is not a negative thing. And I see it that way. I see having these birds in my garden as a really positive thing. I don't cut down any trees. Um, I girdle them and let them stand. And this is an old pear tree that I decided to, uh, uh, I wanted to try a new one. And so I girdle it, it dies. Uh, three years later, I got this be uh, beautiful bloom of uh, shelf fungi. And uh, then the insects move in and you see woodpeckers out there. I'm sure at night mice and things use this. So. I don't burn anything and I don't cut things down and chop them up. I leave them standing as much as I can. And eventually that tree turns into this uh, past the mushroom stage. The insects just almost turn it into powder. And uh, this downy woodpecker uh, literally one year tore this whole tree apart and got all the bugs out of it. So. It's important to know that there's a whole group of, of wildlife out there that depends on old or large circumference trees, and particularly ones that are not doing very well. So keep that in mind. Why would I show a, well, I'm showing a snail, and it's a native snail. Uh, this is the part where if you're a gardener, you can, you can say, wow, I think I'd like that snail. This is a native uh, white-footed snail, and it eats snails. It's a predaceous snail. And if you handle your landscaping correctly, you'll have these in your garden, and they actually help with other snails, the, the, the bad ones. This is a beetle that also, uh, you can see how narrow its shoulders are, wide butt, narrow shoulders. This particular ground beetle specializes in eating snails. And you can see those paddles near the mouth that look like paddles. What he does with the narrow shoulders, he can stick its head all the way back in a snail and it uses those paddles to get every bit of escargot out of that shell. And they actually have a little spot on their side where they keep garlic butter. <laughs> they don't. And anybody recognize this? This is a glowworm. And we have four to five species right here. And uh, this is uh, one that occurs from probably San Diego all the way up into British Columbia. This is the male glowworm, and that's the female. She does not look like an adult. 
she stays a, it's called larva form, and do you see what she's eating? A slug. That's all she eats is slugs. And so this is a great critter to have in your garden. And I probably have 50 to 100 in my vegetable garden every year. And I believe using all these native insects that are all predaceous or making them feel, uh, use our garden helps me a lot in keeping uh, slugs and snails down. Uh, they're not the answer. You still have to squish them, but they help a lot. All right, I'm winding down here. Thank God, huh? Um, this, this is wildlife, and uh, uh, when we first moved uh, to this area in 1977, I should say where we, we garden now, uh, lizards and um, uh, bunnies, rabbits, uh, and many other types of uh, uh, lizards and things like that were quite common. As it built up in cats, uh, became quite common. A lot of this disappeared, and we are cat people. We love cats, but if you can live without a cat, it makes a huge difference in things like lizards, frogs, snakes. Uh, they kill snakes. They don't eat them, um, but if you can get along without it, you will see much more of things like a western skink. And my favorite, I don't know if you can see them, but we always try to keep a toad in our garden. And toads are just great. They come out at night and they eat a lot of things. And when we have neighbors or kids over, we dig up worms and we, we tap on his hole. He lives in a gopher hole. He'll come out and we feed him worms. So we're trying to replace our cat with a toad. I don't know if it'll work. Thank you. Questions? Yes. So, like, how far did you say would be like the best amount of rubber tilt in regard to keep like uh, the bees far by? I can't. How far? I can't. How far did you say um, that it would be the best amount of rubber tilt, like two to three inches or so? What I found when I dug up bee nests in there that uh, they varied quite a bit, um, but one of the close one that built its nest closest was that uh, leaf cutter bee and that was uh, six to nine inches. So I try to do no deeper than three inches. So I don't use one of those big uh, uh, rototillers now. There's a, one called a mantis, it's a little teeny thing, and it actually does not have the ability to go much lower than about three inches. And I have found no difference in my garden production of vegetables or flowers by just doing that, that shallowy. It, it ha seems to have no effect, even though most gardening books uh, are very positive, you should rototill and do it deep. I've, I haven't seen any papers that say why, why that's important except to sell big rototillers. So I think uh, six inches, but you're, it, you, you wanna be above that. Uh, so I, I, I shoot for three inches. So the glowworms, is there anything that you found that you feel has attracted them to your garden or do they think you just had a hot spot? I think they're extremely common up here. And if you go out at night uh, on a spring or fall wet, warm day, not necessarily raining, but wet, you go out I should say in the evening, and look around and adjust your eyes, they're quite common. And what I do is through rototilling, um, use of chemicals, all that kind of stuff, I try to have areas where they can uh, have stability and, and breed and, and do things like that. But the females, when the rain starts and the uh, slugs and snails start, the same time, they're out there feeding on them. And, and I'll go out to the garden part of it, to, to where the vegetables are, and you'll see little uh, green lights all over the place. And so I think it's knowing that they're there. Don't do anything that 
Um, and this is true of all of them. The beetles tend to be the good ones, the, the, the black predaceous and these. Just realize that they're there, provide some uh, places for them to retreat, retreat to. And um, stability is extremely important with bees or those predaceous beetles. Stability is an important part of a landscape, keeping it the same. Don't, you can't do it, uh, turn it all under every year. If you do, you get a whole different set of uh, uh, wildlife there than you would if you have s stable areas with native plants. I should have said that, native plants where they can retreat to. Yes? Thank you. Oh. Um, I, I don't think I need that. Actually, I'm pretty loud. But, um, you know, lampyrids in the east seem to be in decline. Actually, we're seeing a lot of declines in lampyrids, which are related to the glow worms. There are uh, fireflies. Uh, do you know of any studies? Have you seen declines yourself out in the west? Is there any correlation? No, uh, one thing is that I'm a generalist. Um, I'm, not, I'm not anything, maybe a naturalist if I'm anything. Uh, and what I know is my garden. Um, but most of the early work on this, uh, on Xeripus, which is another group that occurs up here, was done in LA years ago. And uh, I know they can exist in urban landscapes uh, the way they're managed now lawns and things like that. They just can't exist. So I suspect a lot of places, except in the hills, they're completely gone. And uh, the same thing is here. They are a group of insects. If we learn to live with them, they will help us and they can live in a garden. But if we do like most of this area where uh, people don't put a lot of value into their garden or their land, it's just something they have to do. Take it. They got to mow it. They got to weed and feed it twice a year and water it. Um, we have very little value for that, and there's very few things that can exist uh, wildlife-wise in, in that type of situation. So, I, I, yeah, I couldn't tell you. I know the more houses you see, the less lampyrids and, and fungodids you're going to see. Okay, one more. Uh, yeah. Um, so as far as talking about like vegetable gardening and stuff like that with native plants, um, do you intermingle native plants in between your vegetable like garden, or is it, is it can you have like two distinguished spots, or is it just is it, you find it beneficial to have native plants intermingled with your vegetable garden for the native insects and stuff like that? Um, no. no. Oh. What I think if we can convince more and more people to use their garden in some valuable way, whether it's for food or, or native plants or wildlife, all of that is good because it starts a, a process where people again value what they live on. And so I don't discourage any type of use of a garden as long as it, it you see it as a value. But what I do, I have distinct areas where I have uh, native plants and you, native plants plus longevity, keeping that area the same year after year after year uh, is equal to more than those two things. It's synergistic. Um, if you change things constantly, there's only a few critters that can tolerate that. So if you have areas along the edge, you might want a um, hedge to, to dampen the noise from the street use native plants in those areas and leave them stable. Uh, what happens is the ground gets built up with all the dead leaves, the roots aerate it. It becomes an environment where uh, that the first invader type insects are no longer happy with. It's the ones that are used to stable environments, which is most of the native uh, wildlife and, and insects like that. So I don't know if it makes sense to you, but the, the native areas are usually areas I leave alone. Uh, they may be colorful or pretty, but uh, my, some of my manzanitas are getting into 20, 25 years old. 
and I think they make a real difference in the garden, both for looks and for wildlife. So I try to plan my garden. I'm a fanatical gardener, so I plan, 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 and I plan for large plants that I'm going to leave in there until they fall over and die. And uh, but I have the ability to do that. It isn't a teeny garden, uh, um, but it's it's a complicated process to to look at and. I've tested a lot of different ones, and I have, have good ways of dealing with that, but it's not appropriate now. I, I could talk five hours on that part of it. But no, you don't necessarily have to mix them. You can. It's kind of better if you want to do it yourself and learn that way. That's how I've learned most of what I know. Anything else? Thank you.